Hello everyone, my name is Rose Simpson. I'm a librarian at the New Haven Free Public Library and welcome to Co-Create. We have today our creative in residence, Nadine Nelson and special guest, Lauren Klein. So why don't you two introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Nadine Nelson. I am the chef, owner, educator, artist of Global Local Gourmet. I am an interdisciplinary artist. I um, am creative. I, I guess specialize, I'm known for my food art, but I'm trying to branch out into other things. I do installations and right now I am working on a table runner for an installation. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And I will say that I will allow Lauren to introduce herself, but I'll say how we know each other. So we met, um, we're in this residency or fellowship, I don't know what you would call it, um, um, doing the artist way, which is a famous book that a lot of creatives and non-creatives but have done where you, for three months, 12 weeks, um, you write in the morning um, your thoughts for three pages, um, it's stream of consciousness. And we've been meeting in with a group of artists around seven or seven of us, I think. Um, yeah. in our group, but there's around 60 artists yeah. and we're divided up into groups. And we talk about our artist pages and in the book, there's all these different um, activities and prompts and we're supposed to do an artist date every week. And so we talk about that and other things. So I'm interested to hear about Lauren's process. Um, and also she does stuff with hair and a whole bunch of other things. So I'll let her introduce herself. Thank you, Lauren, for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm really, I'm really excited. Um, so I'm Lauren Klein. I, uh, my practice is called Aesthetic Autonomy. And I'm here in Mexico City, Mexico, in my studio in Colonia Centro. And um, yeah, so today in the spirit of the artist way, I am working on, I'm gonna be really, I'm really happy to show you my studio and how I work and how I work with clients and how I'm teaching right now. And I'm gonna be just working on these kind of collages um, that are separate from the paintings that I've been doing, but just an exploratory practice for me. Um, so that's what I'm into. And <laughs> did I miss anything? <laughs> All right. Um, no, it's just like a free flow conversation. So we're supposed to just be creating however we want to and talking about whatever we want to. So cool. I'm like, I, I didn't think about, I was going to be self-conscious about sewing because I'm not the best sewer, but um, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to go over it with, um, on a regular machine. So I think it's a lot easier if I do hand stitch it a little bit though. Nice. So that's what I am um, doing. Well, yeah, I really like your hand cam. <laughs> yeah, so I'm in a maker space. So I'm at Make Haven, which is in New Haven. Mm -hmm. And it's a really big um, maker space. And they have all different types of machinery. So like I can, after this, um, doing the pre-pinning, I can go and there's um, sewing machines, there's a wood shop, there's iron shop, like Rose knows all the different machines that are here, like 3D machines and stuff like that. So it's a really, it's a really cool space. They also have a kitchen. Oh. They got nice. a vacuum former, they've got like laser cutters, CNC routers, um, uh, heat press for like heat transfer vinyl. A lot of stuff. That sounds amazing. Well, I'll share you. I'll show you my studio. Um, I'm just gonna turn my camera around. So this is where I work with clients, and um, so my whole practice is about. I work with hair. I work with hair as a way of um, kind of a lens through which we can examine our our beliefs. So here's a big mirror, Nadine. <laughs> Speaking of the mirrors. 
And um, so this is where I work with clients. And I, my goal is to create an environment by using sound. I use original compositions by this composer, Milo Demes, um, and mirror work. So spending a lot of time with people to create an environment where we can start to understand the ways that that, per that person can start to understand the way that they're speaking about themselves. Um, I have learned so much from standing behind a chair for the last 10 years and watching people see themselves in the mirror. It's really powerful. So um, I'm really into just creating this environment where we can um, start to explore where these different beliefs come from, what is inherited, what we really think and believe, and also the way that we are interacting with ourselves and, and then extrapolating how we might be treating other people, judging other people. Um, so that's the practice. And the plants are really a huge part of the practice. Um, this whole room, there's, there is electronic equipment in here. There's the mixer and my computer, but nothing is uh, live. Like there's no Wi-Fi or anything. So the, the space is, is absolutely meant to be a grounding space. And the plants help with that a lot. And the, the sound is a big part of that too. Can you talk a little bit about um, sound and how you use sound and why is sound important? Because I think that um, I try and do a lot of stuff with the five senses. Um, uh -huh. So I think that a lot of times we don't we don't operate in all the different senses. And yeah. I think that sound, sound baths, like different binaural beats and stuff like that, that, that they're really transformative. Um, yeah. And like also like somatic healing and somatic therapy. Yeah, exactly. And I think of it also as an actual physical space to be in. I think it's almost, it's a transportative experience. Um, the sound creates an entire environment. And when you're breathing and just relaxing, and if you're in a space where you can um, allow yourself to not worry about, you know, especially when you're in this position, which is a fairly vulnerable position, when you're getting your hair done, there's such a potential for it to be very disempowering. And, you know, the goal is that that person is actually finding a way to center within themselves, which is not necessarily that easy because we have a lot of beliefs, habits, stigmas, dramas, traumas attached to our bodies and our hair. So the sound plays a really important role. Um, I'm really fascinated with the way sound moves. Um, you know, it's a physical thing. It's physical entities. The physicality of sound at the molecular level is what's really touching us and, and vibrating us and our bodies are a receptor to that sound. So, um, and you know, the way that I work with it is right now there's only two speakers set up, but the, the ideal is when there's at least four speakers. Um, I'm gonna show you, sorry, I'm like. So the idea is that it's, it's spatialized. So on that note of the binaural uh, sound or binaural beats, um, what makes that effective is that your, your right ear and your left ear are hearing two different things. Um, so the spatialized sound is effective in that way because it's activating our brains and minds and bodies in a way that's really unique um, compared to our everyday life. The whole, the whole practice, I think, what's really powerful about it is this idea of creating a very intentional vibrational environment. And, you know, Mexico City is an enormous, enormous city. It's so, it's, it's, it's incredibly beautiful and it's incredibly chaotic. Um, so, 
and so many cities are like that, you know, um, but we don't often find places of respite within the city where we can kind of step outside of our lives, step outside of um, other experiences and just find a way to be centered. So all of that relates to the sound and, and the way that our bodies receive sound and the way that we are impacted by our sonic environments. So how do you feel like we're impacted by our sonic environments? I think that, um, I mean, I think there's a physical impact, you know, like it can, it can cause, if something is, if our, if the vibrational, if the, if the frequent, if there's like a super high pitched frequency or something so loud, or just, if you imagine all the cars, all the electrical equipment and devices, like everything that's happening all the time, it, it makes an impact on our bodies. We're absorbing it, we're hearing it, even if we're not hearing it. So I think that the potential impact is that it elevates our, our stress levels or, our whole shifts and impacts our chemical makeup of our bodies. Um, and then can you explain what binaural beats are to people? Because I don't, I think I came to them like, um, I think one of my friends um, shared with me what they they were, but um, I, I really like them for helping with sleep, but then yeah. also, Last year when I had a really terrible, um, I was grinding my teeth because of stress. Yeah. Um, my friend suggested to who is like, she's a Reiki master and also a yoga teacher and you know, all around like new age <laughs> mama. And uh -huh. um, she, she suggested that I, you know, do binaural beats for my teeth. And so I looked at, um, you know, I went on YouTube, like, um, looked one up and within like three days, it was fine. After like six wow. weeks of like grinding my teeth down, to, it was just awful. I couldn't eat. Um, I was taking so much pain medication that I was afraid that like the lining of my stomach was gonna go. But then I started listening to the binaural beats and three days later, I was like, fine. Wow, that's incredible. Um, well, the technical, parts of them of a binaural beat is that it's two different frequencies and um, frequencies which are measured in Hertz. It's the same thing as a note. Binaural beats are made with usually MIDI, like um, an electric tone. So there are no, there are no harmonics. So you can be really, really precise. And different binaural beats are set. What makes it, um, but I believe that the way, for example, if you found something that works for one thing, there could be binaural beats that are designed to be um, energizing and there are binaural beats that are designed to be relaxing. And, um, and so if what I believe that changes that is the interval between the two notes. So, you know, it's usually a very short in interval between the two notes. So um, what happens is our brains, and then you isolate from one ear to the other. One ear is one note and the other ear hears the other note. And the really effective way that they work is by listening in headphones. So what happens is our, our brains kind of create this, well, a beat. Like it, the way that we hear it um, creates something that doesn't exist in reality uh, or in the physical space. And so it's almost like, now this is not, what I'm about to say is, is totally not scientific at all, but the way I, I think about it is it's like, you can, it's like you're pointing from one side of your head and you're pointing from another side of your head and then they like kind of cross somewhere <laughs> and that's what you're hearing and that's what can make a positive impact on your, on your body. I really like them. Hi, Andrew, how are you? I don't know if he's gonna talk. Well, thank you for being here, Andrew. Rose, Andrew is on your board. 
Oh, nice. Okay, nice to meet you. Um, so do you want to talk about what maybe, um, I asked a variety of questions, like I asked people about their art journey, but I think what might be interesting being that we're stuck here, um, those of us that are on here, at least in New Haven, <laughs> like uh -huh. um, what Mexico City is like and yeah. how you got there. And, you know, it's such a vibrant art community and historically, but then, you know, like, I think that a lot of people don't realize how vibrant a city is. Like, I know, like, in regard to food, I've always wanted to go, but then of course, in regard to art, but um, so yeah, talk about yeah. Mexico City, how you got there, the art community there. Yeah. Have so, some wonder, wonder lust through you. <laughs> so I arrived here in 2017. Um, I was doing a residency at the Museum of Human Achievement, which is in Austin, Texas. And during that residency, I was working on this series of paintings and um, doing a lot of recordings, field recordings, just, uh, I did a show, I put together a show of work that I did during the residency. But one morning I was in my studio early and there were a bunch of people around the space that I'd never seen before. And I was listening and I just, or I was just in my studio painting and then I heard this sound, this note being played um, on the clarinet. And I was like, who could that be? And I just walked out and there was a guy just standing there like about to play the next note. And I was like, hi, I'm Lauren. Hey, I'm working on these paintings which are about sound. And I wondered if you would be into doing a quick collaboration. And so he came in and he went and got a friend who was a trumpet player. And um, we talked about the work and the paintings in that series, um, it's called Fono Figura, which is sound shape. And it was all about the last two series of works that I've done have really all been about sound, not only um, like the way, the way sound moves and as well, um, this idea of the vibrational environment. So they each chose a painting and played an interpretation of the paintings as a duo. And after that, one of them, whose name is Ramon Dobuy, said, hey, you know, there's actually a lot of people in Mexico City working on this at one particular art house. You should, you should check it out. And at that point in my life, I had just declared that I was going to let my art carry me anywhere in the world. And I had saved, you know, been working and saved up a bunch of money to be able to just take some months off from my work. And so I just came down here. I found that art house on, um, it was a, the people who were in the, in the studio at the time were musicians from Mexico City. And they were part of a, um, a festival called the No Idea Festival, which is this um, festival that brings artists from all over to Austin to put them together, to improvise together. So those guys, we're also connected with this art house here. So I came down here and I did a residency um, in sound and started my research, which was called Taurus Project, which is about the way that sound physically impacts the body, which was a eight channel sound installation. And from there started to you know, develop further the work I'm doing now, which was, had been in my mind for a long time. And then I just kind of never left Mexico. I got invited into another project after that residency ended, and then I'm here. The city is um, incredibly vibrant, as you said. The, the food culture is so incredible and uh, gorgeous. The art community is vast um, and international. Do you see yourself coming back to the States? I'm not so sure. Um, my, my partner and I, who I met here, we, we met working together um, on, on a project. And 
We're not so sure. We're we're kind of build. We're we're definitely working here and building, and um, it's almost four years. So who knows? <laughs> Pandemic kind of influences, you know, choices and and um, abilities to move around. So not so clear. How do you? How do you? Um... Are you, how do you feel like the pandemic is different there than it is here in America? And do you, are you, are you happy to be there? I know like a lot of my friends that are outside the country, they seem like they're having a much, even though you know they, that you have to self isolate and everything like that, it seems like it's a lot more humane and better outside of America. Well, my main observation, I haven't really spent any time. I, would, I, I did see my family for about 12 days in September. Um, and that was the first kind of moments of um, being in the US during this new era. And uh, my impression of the main difference is that it's in no way that I have observed or seen, is it a political issue to wear a mask? It's just people wear them. The people um, take a lot of care with the allowing people to come into their stores. You have to be wearing your, you know, personal protective stuff. You have to have your temperature taken every time you go inside anywhere. Um, you walk through a little tray of bleach and and stamp your shoes out on a towel before you can go enter into the place. So um, I think I had been, you know, it's, it's hard to say because um, I think there's so much powerful, um, powerful ways of giving to, community and cultures in the US that could be really powerful and effective. So there's part of me that would love to, to have my projects there. Before the pandemic, I was going to New York and San Francisco like every quarter to work. Um, and so that has stopped. Um, but I'm, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to have the privilege of getting to know this country and this city and the culture. And I can't even imagine, you know, I live with a Mexican man, but like, and I, I live here in this country. Um, but it's such an incredibly rich place with such incredible deep history and uh, complexity. Like, I don't think I could ever really know it, you know? Mm. And do you feel like, um, you know, when I lived in um, Paris for six weeks and uh -huh. I, I didn't leave, I only left the city to go to Versailles one day and I got invited to go to the South of France and other places. And I was like, there's just so much to see like the 20 arrangements, you know, and I lived in three and I was out like all the time. And I just can't even imagine like, um, you know, the size of Mexico City and then how you said about like finding your peace. Like I loved Paris, but um, mm -hmm. I was just like, there's nowhere that you could be, like even though they had so many parks that you could find, um, like living in Boston for 23 years. I love Boston because you, you can find your own private spot in so many different places where you can just be alone in the city. In yeah. Paris, in Paris, it was just like, it was never any place. Like I walked, yeah. everyone was like, my God. So is that how Mexico City is? Yeah. Yeah, it's so, it's so dense. <laughs> it's so dense. Um, if you want, I could actually just walk out onto the roof and show you the street. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, let me. Um, I love your space, by the way. I wanted to tell you that. I love, like, you can see how zen and serene it is. Um, with the um, 
with the plants and I love the mirror. And I want to come back and ask you about mirror work because I do oh, yes. that in my Oshun exhibit. So I want to I want to yeah. talk to you about that. And I also want to talk to you. I want to get controversial and talk about hair, different ethnicity and hair because yeah, have you worked with black hair? And, uh, you know, like, you know, what have you seen and all that First. kind of stuff. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in quickly while you're walking. Yes. Yeah. Say that we're in New Haven and in New Haven wearing a mask is not political. So oh, okay. I just want to defend um, <laughs> New Haven. Everybody wears a mask here. Oh, that's so good. Mm -hmm. I just, I have friends, my, you know, just have a, a couple friends in Texas and around and what you see, you know, I'm somebody who now it's like what you see in the news is what I know and what I see. So this is the Centro of Mexico City and the district I live in, it's kind of like Soho. There's a ton of chandelier stores and lighting stores, kitchen supply stores. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, Mexico City is at the center, uh, like on the kind of top of this mountain surrounded by volcanoes. So if you have the view to see the horizon, anywhere you look, you can see mountains and, and volcanoes. Beautiful. It reminds me of what I went, I had to go to Boston for business last week and how Boston is right now, like, it's kind of like there are people there, but it's kind of like ghost town-ish, you know? Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. Yeah. So, and this, this building is 100 years old. Um, it's pretty impressive. It's a beautiful courtyard. Yeah, it is beautiful. Yeah, the architecture in Mexico City is so beautiful too, and so varied. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's really incredible. So, let me get back here. So yeah, Nadine, what were you, let, let's talk, let's talk about hair, let's talk about mirror work. Yes, yes, okay. Sure. okay. Wait, wait, let me have my daughter take that off for you. Can you take that off for him, please? And I think you have it on me as opposed, as a, I, think, I don't know if you've had it on me the whole time. We have different cameras going. So what did you just ask me, Lauren? I got distracted. Someone asked me um, to do something. Oh no, it's all good. I was saying, um, I said, let's let's talk about hair and, and mirror work. I'm so curious how you have used it in your workshops and if you use it personally. And... So why don't we talk about something that um, will bring us together first because who knows what about hair. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like in regards to mirror work, so, um, um, the installation that's behind me in my picture is my Oshun exhibit. And so um, I've been working on some mirrors and if I have a chance, it's in another room um, to show you, but I'll show you later anyway, a mirror I've been working on I, and I got some other mirrors. I'll show you the vintage mirrors that I got in a second. But um, so Oshun is a goddess of um, love, um, the West African, Nigerian Yoruba, um, Yoruba, um, goddess of love and beauty. And she asked for you to do mirror work. And so to look into the mirror and say sweet things to yourself. And so like my Oshun exhibit is all about um, self-love is transformation and the love that we want from other people. We have to find first within ourselves. And so, especially like with women, but I think that it goes for men or any one of any gender that, um, that you know, you if you're if you're feeling, I think affirmations are really good. And so, um, when 
right behind me, there's the altar and there's the mirror. And so you can do your own, you can write your own affirmation, you can write your own mantra. And then there's mirrors there um, for you. There's a whole bunch of different mirrors, but then there's also a hammer mirror for you to look at yourself and be able to do your affirmations for yourself. And I think that um, it's a wonderful thing to do when you're not feeling confident and all of that. So to do that kind of, that mirror work with your affirmations. So yeah, that's what I do. I love in the installations, I don't, you know, like I like to do have stuff for people to do when I'm not there, you know, like, so there's little mantra cards that people can um, write for themselves. And then um, they can grab a mirror and then sit down at the altar and say their affirmations also. Yeah. That's so beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. I didn't know that there's a goddess that asks you to do mirror work. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Oshun is also the goddess of fresh water. So she's the goddess of light. So prosperity, life, beauty, sensuality, all of that. So I, I love all the different um, things that she personifies. And we we're talking about the five senses. Yeah. And so um, I have stuff that you can um, smell because she like likes orange and lemon and you leave, um, you leave um, gifts for her and stuff like that. So she loves vanilla. So like there's vanilla for people to smell. Wow. Um, that kind of stuff. Wow, that's really beautiful. I use scent in my in my work as well. Um, I have a lot of different scents that um, I use. Rosemary is a is a big one, um, and also I, I mix them for the body. I make some oils that you can use to massage your scalp, um, and I think that. Yeah, I find it definitely a trans, such a, a transformative and transportative experience for, for, for people and myself. Why do you use rosemary? I know like uh, there's different properties for it, you know, so. Yeah, well, there, the, there's a few reasons. One is it feels, it, there was a, it was an intuition for me. I was feeling really called to it. Um, and it's, I know that it has properties of, of focusing and clarity. Exactly. And then also, yeah. And then also it's really good when it's, you know, used in a carrier oil, it's really healthy for the scalp. It increases circulation and it's also antimicrobial. So it's just really healthy. It's, it has a reputation of helping hair grow faster. Yeah. Along with peppermint, do you use peppermint? I do, yeah. Yep. Um, so how do you have, how, so let's talk about hair and race. Yeah. So you're the hair expert, so I wanna hear what you have. <laughs> well, you know, I, be, I became a hairstylist. I studied sculpture and sociology. And a few years later, I, I began an apprenticeship that was a four year long apprenticeship in a high end salon in San Francisco. And there's something I would call, I would call it like a classical, you know, it's like a very, it's a Vidal Sassoon based technique that they're teaching, although it's um, not directly from Vidal Sassoon. So within that environment, I was always, um, noticing, well, you know, my hair is really 3D and um, it's always been that way. And- I love it. Oh, thank you. And, um, and there's just a lot of stuff I noticed. I was always very interested in texture and uh, the title of my soiree was texture. And, um, and I just noticed different things, like for example, 
people were treated differently. There's a lot of discrimination against people with abundant hair or very thick hair um, or very textured hair. Uh, people were like, I don't know, I don't know what to do or, you know, go in the break room and, and think and, and that I think for a long time was very common and I'm, I think it's changing now. Um, but there was just kind of this disparity that I noticed that I wasn't a fan of. Um, and so with my own work and my own projects, when I left that salon, okay, so you're talking about, we're talking about hair and race. With basically like the history of beauty, um, it comes from the history of enslavement and idealized beauty is kind of, has always been about like enslaved <laughs> women. This is pretty heavy, both, both, you know, even before racialization and in, in the, before it was about race, um, it was more about this other aspect of just, um, using people. <laughs> um, so, so I started just thinking about the way that we humans have our identity very much wrapped up in, the, in our appearance. And historically women have been valued based on how they look, how they're perceived. You know, we learn it from our mothers, our grandmothers, um, that, you know, how we should look both for our own success, for our safety, for protection, um, that, you know, and then also there's other aspects that aren't quite as heavy, like beauty is fun, hair is fun, these things are fun. Um, however, there's such discrepancy in hair and it is one of the things that is used, texture is used as like an identifying factor for discrimination, for microaggressions, for, you know, races for pure racism. So I developed this um, practice where I only see people who wear their hair in their natural texture um, or who, you know, are not actively straightening their hair. I am, I have a practice that's just making it easier for anybody who wants to wear their hair in its most natural state to do that. So I have this method called conscious hair cutting where I'm using the growth pattern of the hair to build shapes to bring out more texture in the hair. And my theory, my theory, my posit, what I'm proposing is that when, if, if more and more people were to wear their most natural hair, it would actually be a form of social honesty. And instead of um, aligning ourselves on this spectrum, because there is this spectrum, the categorization of humans that happens with hair. I mean, there's over the course of history, um, you know, and, and we, we use it today in these, in the, you know, I forget the name of the man who developed the, the, the texture chart so we can identify our hair and talk about it with each other, you know? Um, but Four C's and all that kind of exactly, stuff. Exactly. Um, and there's other examples of that in the course of history that uh, weren't used in banal ways, you know? Um, so if, we, if we're thinking about honesty or truth in terms of like empirical scientific truth, um, social truth and personal truth, hair kind of touches all of those three things. There's, you know, our hair reveals our, our, our makeup, our chemical, you know, our, our DNA. It speaks to migration and place. Um, it also has always been used as a representation of class and um, as social signifiers and codes. And so those are all the things that I think about with this project. And it's very controversial, it clearly. Um, it touches on such intimate, both intimate in a, to the person, but also across all cultures. Um, it's such a it's such a touchy subject. Um, so, 
Yeah, that's those are some things I'm thinking about when I think about hair and race. Um, well, um, you can ask me a question about it. <laughs> if you sure. want. It's just like so, it's so broad. Well, yeah, so I mean, what do you think about hair and race? Um, I think, you know, I think that people can wear their hair however they want. I think it's like all up to, it's like um, self-identification, you know? Um, yeah. Some people call themselves black. Some people call themselves African-American. Some people call themselves Negro. It's not really up to me to decide. I think that as a black woman, a lot of people want to decide for me the way I wear my hair. That has to mean something. I think that, you know, I'm Jamaican and there's a lot of Rastafarians that are, have bald heads, you know, there's a lot of people who are Rastafarians that are fashion dreads, you know, so um, there are people that, that are women who have short hair that are not lesbian and, you know, like, you know, like, so just like you said, like, there's so many different things that people read into it. Yeah, and yeah. Think, and I think that it's really a personal choice. I think that um, I don't like when I think it, I, I think it, I, 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 it hurts me when people who have curly hair don't, because um, mostly people who have curly hair, there's people who have straight hair that want curly hair, but it's mostly usually people who have curly hair that want um, straight hair. I think that's unfortunate. Um, like when you don't feel like you're beautiful because of your hair, it's like, I yeah. think it's unfortunate if you don't think you're beautiful because of your nose or, you know, yeah. like I'm one of those people you accept yourself for who you are. Um, but um, so. Yeah, and I think, you know, this, this project is developed for me based on observing the way that people talk about themselves when they're telling me about their hair, you know, as a stylist. So talk about that. Well, the language people use frequently on that, like what you're speaking about, like, some people are like, I love my curls. Like, yes, let's do this. And a lot of times those people have had um, difficult experiences in the world because they've gone into salon spaces or they've gone to these places where they've been treated poorly because somebody didn't know how to, to work with their hair, you know? And, and, or it was a very disempowering experience for them or, they were told emphatically that they had to straighten it or it was just naturally assumed that it would be straightened at the end of the appointment or that the haircut that they got was designed for straight hair. So to me, when I think of that as a stylist, I started like a few years ago, I, I, would, say thing, I would say things like, judging by how difficult it is for people to find a curly, a, a haircut or a hairdresser that's excellent with curls, one would assume that there are very few people with curls and textured hair in, on the planet. <laughs> but that's just not true, <laughs> you know? But it is like, even, but even as a black woman, you know, having natural hair, it is so hard to find hairstylists, even though more and more people are doing their hair, have their hair natural now. Um, I've had my hair pretty much natural since college. So that's like 30 years and it's so, it's still hard to find a natural, a person who, who does natural hair and feels comfortable doing it. And um, who feels comfortable and wants to do it actually too, like, because people can know how to do it, but then a lot of black um, stylists, they won't do it because they feel it's like much more hassle and, you know, whatever. So thank God I've had the same pretty much stylist in New Haven for the last couple of years. And then I have a stylist in, New York that I've had for over 20 years, I think. Yeah. And she makes, she, Lauren, she makes hair for me. <laughs> cool. She makes hair based on um, my natural hair. So it looks like my natural hair. That's awesome. That's I just awesome. wanted to jump in and say, I'm really someone who's really traumatized by hair. 
Yeah. So, um, because I have naturally wavy hair. Yeah. And it doesn't fit either anything. And for I a call it I call it three three D. <laughs> it's about <laughs> this, right? So I used to live off and on in um, Provence in the south of France. Um, and I had somebody who could cut my hair there. And sometimes I would just, people would laugh, but it's like, I would go to France to get a haircut. You know, um, I was usually in a show or something too, because I had a career there. And then other people could follow it. So if I did it that once a year, I was okay. But then one year I went to get my haircut and... Um, they had retired. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is it uh, is kind of a funny story, if we can get a little ethnic about this, because I, I walked in to this place and they said, I said, what happened? And, you know, the, the younger person who worked there had moved to a salon out in the suburbs and obviously they didn't have a car with me when I was in Avignon. So I said, okay, I just, you know, and... I walked around the block then because the place had turned into a restaurant. And then I thought, um, well, I'm hungry. So I may as well have lunch. So I went back and I said, I'll have lunch. And I was talking to the person because they had mostly vegetarian food and I'm vegetarian. And she's, she's, I asked her if, you know, if she was vegetarian and she said she tried to keep mostly vegetarian because she was trying to keep mostly kosher. So the end of the story is I, I didn't get my hair cut, but I got a Friday night dinner invitation. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> but anyway, um, the hair thing, I mean, I've had salons that I've walked into and really been so nervous about what was gonna happen that they refused to cut my hair. Cause exactly. I did that. Yeah, yeah, I, I've, I'm, I'm a stylist and I still have found myself having that experience that I'm talking about. And I'm so educated and activated about it, yet I have still had that experience of sitting in someone's chair and being like, holy shit, why do I feel so bad right now? What is going on? And then I'm like, oh my God, it's happening again. It's happening to me. This thing where like somebody doesn't know what they're doing or they're aggressing against you or ignoring your needs for whatever their thing is. Um, but and Nadine, you know, on the on the hair and race thing, like I am, I am not a black woman. Um, I could, I can't speak to the experience of a black woman. Um, but when I think about like the problems that are existing, you know, racism is a public health issue, and it's like, and I observe and I, I interact with people across different sectors um, that just don't empathize or have a perspective that would allow them to understand in any way um, details of experience and, and, and perspectives across cultures in society. And what I see though is like um, beauty and hair and hairstyles, um, particularly the straightening of hair or chemically relaxing hair is something that maybe people have felt pressured to do. You know, I know that like in work environments, people have been aggressed upon because of their hair, you know? And when I think of that, what I think is like, uh, I'm not like, People, every person needs the, to the chance to breathe into who they are and stop expending the energy where they're just doing this around themselves to protect and like keep out negativity and threats. So like, what if, you know, I, like, what is the thing that's around people? Well, it's like family, community, institutions and governments. Like if the individual is at the center of a circle and then concentric circles around that person is their family, their communities, their institutions they are involved in, oh, and, then, and then governments, like how do you, how, how, what needs to adjust 
for people to feel more comfortable. It's not the person, it's not the person that has to adjust. It should be their, their concentric circles, you know? And so when I think about, what, that's how I think about the work that I'm doing is like, if I can create a service where I, and people are invited in to sit down, look in the mirror, do mirror work, be in a safe space where they can say things. And then I'm not going to be like, oh, what are, you, what are you talking about? You're gorgeous. Like, I don't think that's the right answer. I think the answer is like, oh, I noticed you said this, <laughs> you know, do, do, and then usually people are like, oh my gosh, yeah. And then I'm like, do you know where that comes from? And then they're like, my mom, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And, and so there's this, inherited set of beliefs and it's it's so tricky to speak about because what I what I really just want to say is like this entire planet has been has is colonized we are in the era of all of our structures and systems that we live in and exist in are built with these certain with these specific beliefs that happened to evolve around 500 years ago during you know the the like colonization and the beginning of the humanist era when we started talking about human rights but the thing is that not everybody had human rights you know we started talking about the human being but not everybody was considered a human being so now everything we're seeing and experiencing today is the result of that, that's where we're at. So like, how can we make subtle shifts? And, and when I say we, I, I, mean, I mean, I want to say that um, I think that we is actually not a plural word. It's more like a singular pronoun. So like, I think I, I use the word we's I pluralize the word we. So we's, uh, you know, all have different things to do to shift. But I think that the point is, what I believe is that in, uh, everyone, no matter what kind of work we do, whether it's a trade or, um, you know, if we're an artist or we're a tradesperson, can we make choices within that work? which are intentional towards creating more spaciousness in our cultures. Like for me, I'm like, okay, I'm an artist, but I'm a hairdresser. This is my trade, you know? So how can I do what I do and do it in a way that supports my beliefs and values and then help other people who who might be interested in that to, to create a space for them and offer services for them, which allow them to explore those beliefs and values, or if they already have those, they feel really good. So when you, Soleil, can you give me another girly for me, please? Um, when you do the mirror work, what are some of the things that you do? A girly. My, my personal mirror work practice yeah. is that I usually am doing head massage, scalp massage. Um, and I'm usually, usually using an oil that I've mixed that's very nourishing and I tune it with sound. Um, and I'm calming my breathing and feeling my own touch on my head and also noticing, first I try to notice what comes up when I'm looking in the mirror. Um, Just take note of that because I think that's really important fodder. (laughs) Um, And then I'm, yeah, just giving myself a lot of love and appreciation. And um, I think it has to, I think for me, it has a lot to do with slowing down. And you know, something else that I do, because I think is really powerful is I, I also teach people, like share my skills. So I, I teach people how to cut their own hair. And that's, I think, a really powerful form of mirror work too. 
that must be very empowering for people. Um, people love it, yeah. And so describe like you've been in a bunch of different artist communities and how have they been different like in San Francisco, New York, um, Mexico City, I don't know wherever else you have been. Yeah. I'll talk about that. Yeah, so I'm, um, I'd say like in San Francisco, uh, I was really, my scene was the experimental music scene. Mm -hmm. um, and there were just incredible musicians there, composers, people creating new music. And um, during that time, so that I would say like in my experience, this, the art scenes in San Francisco were kind of separate. Like I didn't know a bunch of like in Mexico, they call we people who work with painting or, or sculpture are called plastic artists or like plastic arts. So there weren't like a lot of people that I knew in that scene that were, there wasn't a lot of collaboration between um, like visual artists and musicians, um, but it was a really vibrant, vibrant scene at that time. And then I was in Brooklyn and I wasn't part of an art scene there. I was there for three years. And I did not really seek it. I did not find it. It did not come to me. <laughs> um, and I spent time in Austin. And in Austin, it's, it's kind of beautiful. Like everybody, it seems to me like most people know each other. And there's a lot, a lot going on all the time. And there's a lot of... Uh, there's some places where music and art can cross over. Um, and my impression of Austin, I was just there for a few months, but it was that people approach their work with um, some levity, which is nice. And then um, here I arrived to a house called Espectro Electromagnetico, which is a, um, it means electromagnetic spectrum. And I loved it there. I didn't know what I was walking into. I was so lucky to arrive there. Um, it was a fantastic mix of people who were doing film, sculpture, design, industrial design, working with light and projection, choreographers, um, sound installation, just a lot woodworking, fabric, you know, just across the board. And that was like heaven. <laughs> um, that house actually shut down, which was so sad, is like ran out of its five year lease. But the scene was incredible, um, vibrant for me, just felt like, oh, this is kind of everything I need. You could do anything. You can, people are, you know, just creating and connecting. I think that I was so lucky to be part of that residency because the way it was set up was you design your own project. And then um, the two facilitators once a month would bring in people from the community who could help you with where you were at with your project. So every month we'd have like a day of, of, people, of working artists coming in and sharing, um, sharing their knowledge and their expertise. It was awesome. Uh, there's, there's a couple, there's like a whole other, um, gallery scene in Mexico City and like I'm not like I'm I know some of it but to me it feels vast <laughs> it's like enormous <laughs> so there's a lot of I think here there's just so many different communities actually so many different communities of artists What are you doing right now? I'm doing something with this, this hair, the Kinecolon hair, which okay. is often used for braids. Yeah. Um, and I'm just using it as a drawing tool. I've 
I just did this for the first time the, like two, yesterday. I was like just playing because I was feeling a lot of pressure around painting. Like painting wasn't feeling relaxing. So I was just like, okay, I need to not paint. <laughs> um, so I'm using the same idea of subject matter, which is around these ideas of like harmonics and frequencies. And so that's what I, I'm kind of imagining as I'm as I'm putting this on this piece of canvas with spray glue. Okay. Yeah. Are you prepping and, it before? Yeah, um, like I don't I don't know if I'm gonna put paint on it or or not. I'm just kind of doing. Yeah. You want to talk about the artist way? Yes. So let's go and you get the um. Thing over there. Okay, so talk about it. I, I told people a little bit about it at the beginning. Yeah. So maybe you want to, because people pop in and out of this kind of recording. So maybe you want to yeah. describe it again. Yeah. So uh, let's see. The Artist Way is a book. It's like a course. It's like, can be a self guided course on recovering your creativity and or finding it if you think you don't if you if you think you never had it um and so it's 12 weeks and every week is a chapter in the book and um each chapter has a topic and a, a reading and also um the author speaks directly to you about what you may be experiencing at that point in the course and there's a lot of um requests for engagement and i mean like there's a lot of activities in the book like okay do this here's 10 things you can choose from to do which will help you at this point and you can choose what you want but the consistent this the consistent request of the artist's way are two things it's um writing morning pages so writing three pages with by hand every morning, and then also the artist date. And um, the artist date is where you, the artist by themselves, gives themselves permission as, as something on their list of things to do, to go engage with their artist self. So that could look like whatever you want. Um, so yeah, I think we're on week seven or something like this. And uh, uh, this time, I did this once before and I found the, the first time I did it was about 10 years ago. And I was so diligent. I was like, because at that moment in my life, it felt like life and death. Like if I didn't start practicing what I needed to practice, I was going to die. <laughs> no, part of me was going to die. And so I was so diligent with it. And it was very, very helpful. And, and this time around, I am so much more lax. <laughs> but I'm still really enjoying it. Um, I'd say for me, the best part of working through the, the course this time is just connecting with people. I think it's really fun to have the opportunity to um, share about process and kind of be intimate as as artists. Uh, so I really enjoyed that part of working through the book this time. How many pages have you done this week? Oh my gosh, Nadine, this has been the hardest week for me. <laughs> This week, I think I've only done like two days. <clears throat> yeah, I think I only did the weekend. I did a lot on the weekend though. Yeah. I did more than, I just did a lot of writing. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah. So how how's your experience of it? How are you feeling about it or, you know? My, my impression of you is that you're, prolific with, with regardless of the book, so. Well, I mean, I would like to do the writing more. And I think that the stream of consciousness, it's really good. Yeah. It gets out a lot of yuck out of your head. 
at the beginning of the day. So I do like that when I can do that. Um, I need to be a little bit more intentional about my artist dates. I do get them in, but I need to be a little, I think a little bit more intentional about it. Um, I think that if there's one thing I could say that I absolutely need in my life right now, it's, it's that it's like taking myself on an, on a date, whether, whether I'm thinking it's an artist date or not. Um, and that's because I spend, I just spend so much time inside my house. Like I really need to use those artist dates as a, as a way to get out. Yeah. Um, I haven't been doing a lot of the tasks, so I look forward to doing it over again. It's just like, I'm just so busy that it's really hard to, you know, do all of those different things. I think that just getting the artist date and doing um, my three pages a day, if I can do seven days straight for two weeks, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I'm really happy. Yeah, it's major. I will say this, I finished, this is actually probably why I haven't been great on my pages. I finished my notebook. I completely filled it with artist pages, with morning pages. So I have to get a new notebook so that I enjoy doing the pages again. Yeah. And have you prepared for our takeover? We're doing an Instagram takeover, folks, and we're doing it in the form of the rainbow. So what have you thought about? I'm just thinking of, I'm just mentally preparing. I've just been thinking about taking photos of different things, anticipating that being part of my practice starting tomorrow. I think it's gonna be fun. Um, I noticed that the group that's, that just finished uh -huh. had a couple ideas that were really similar to ours. Um, one is that at some point people were, somebody was posting just a field of color and saying like, use this field of color as a writing prompt. And then, um, and then also just today they posted like an, an exquisite corpse thing, which we also talked about. Hmm, interesting. I have to yeah. go and look at it tomorrow. I have some, I have two pictures for red. Oh, nice. You're planning I wanted, it. I wanted, I wanted to, um, I wanted to do a whole um, fashion thing. Yeah. Like do different colors. And I do have like some, but I want to be all grandiose with it. I don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. I might do one color. I might do purple. We have, we have, we have indigo and then we have violet. So maybe I'll do something for violet, who knows? Yeah, nice. Um, I, I just plan, I guess the way I'm thinking about it, now that you're talking about it, I understand my own thinking more, which is that I'm just thinking about it as like, <laughs> even though I already know, I know that we, we discussed what color was which day, I'm kind of thinking like, oh, whenever, you know, it's day, it's orange day, what will I take a picture of? Hmm, that'll be fun. <laughs> That's how I'm thinking about it. Tell us about the food in Mexico City and what do you eat? I mean, we cook at home a lot. We've been eating a lot of fish and rice and, and making sushi, so. <laughs> okay. But the food in Mexico City is incredible. Um, you know, there's a show on Netflix. Uh, one of the producers is actually my client for a while before she left Mexico. Um, but it's called the I think it's called Taco Chronicles. Yeah. And I think that is a really great show because I, I watched the first season. And what was good about it to me was that it made me feel so emotional like so emotional because of the care and love and like pride of the food preparers, everyone, you know? Um, 
So I think that show does a great job. And I think that's what food is. That's what it is here. It's so, it's so, it's just is, it is the culture, you know? Um, I don't usually get political, but since you're in another country, how, how, how did, how did people respond to the election? Um, I mean, everybody was just like, exact kind of exasperated, you know, like waiting, just waiting, just waiting. Like, man, I hope you guys can do it, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, not everybody who's Mexican hates Donald Trump, um, but so there's no, there's no way to like, uh, assume that, but I would say most people that I encounter are, are not a fan. So I think um, like people are pleased that the election went the way it did. I think people were slightly nervous and feeling disappointed at, at and you know, the reality, which we saw, which was that it took a long time to sort out the votes and, and also that it was, so many people did vote for him. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. What, is, how about, let's see. Well, here's, here's a question. Have you, do you, like, have you been to Mexico City? No, I've only been to Acapulco. Okay, yeah. Don't judge me. <laughs> Hopefully I we're not judging. Hopefully we're not judging each other. <laughs> no. Um, I went to Acapulco because um, they had the Black Film Festival there. Now I think that that festival is in Miami now. Uh -huh. um, but my friend was in a film and we went to go support her. It was fun. We met um, Denzel Washington. I got a picture with him. Cool. And yeah, it was really fun. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think that Acapulco is like a representation of Mexico. Totally, totally. But it is a real place in Mexico. I mean, no, you know. I know, but it's like <laughs> I, I, I never, I never need to go back. I'll be fine. Uh -huh. um, well, do you have an impression of of Mexico City or? Oh, a lot of my friends have um, been there, and um, um, I have friends that have lived there, so. Um, I'm trying to situate my, this thing that I'm so, yeah. um, so I've always wanted to go. Like I said, I've always, you know, I love Frida Kahlo. I love Diego Rivera, like in regards to, um, I used to teach a class called um, Art and Literature of Social Change. And, you know, like I love the muralist movement and all those people. And then Frida Kahlo just being an independent woman and, you know, that their story, but, um, um, yeah, I've always wanted to go to Mexico City. I always thought it was, you know, from what I heard, everyone that I know that's been there or lived there, they've loved it, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, you should, whenever you can, and let me know, and I'll take you to one of the, you know, personal favorite taquerias. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So where do you see your, um, also describe your art journey. Okay. Um, well, I studied sculpture at Kansas City Art Institute. Um, and I kind of didn't expect to, to go into sculpture. I thought I was going to be a painter and study okay. painting. Um, and then had some, you know, definitely opening experiences with, and um, just reframing uh, 
art as a as a value and the function how art it can be can be <laughs> um and decided to move into sculpture i once i went into school i started um making work that was about experiences experiences in the world like uh and and speculating on other humans experiences and i started using sound to talk about that um and create experiences for people uh, so that you could kind of step into other people's shoes or have have this kind of fantastic my version of a, a thought, like experiencing somebody else's thought process mm -hmm. so sound sound became a really strong tool for me and then um i actually had this experience of realizing that one for 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 a few reasons one um we had a new professor come in and i think i was like 21 at the time and he was just like 26 and had gotten his master's like and then just started teaching immediately after doing his bachelor bachelor's master's teaching immediately and i felt like before him we had um, been working with somebody who had a really strong perspective and so i felt really like affronted <laughs> that this person was here to to teach um, and I felt like at that moment, I felt like, oh, what is he trying to teach me just how to be in art school? And I, did, I just didn't like that at all. Um, and I made a decision that I was going to get 10 years of life experience before I pursued any other degree. And so from there, I went into political activism and organizing. Well, no, I, I was kind of organizing. Um, I was working for organizers and um, went to San Francisco kind of by chance, just took that, took a leap of traveling with, you know, just in with a backpack. So I've done that twice in my life, just leaving and just being like, okay, I'm gonna make something work. So the first time I did that was to LA, but that only lasted for a month. LA wasn't for me. So I just took a train up to San Francisco and like was there, got a job and um, working with a political organizing canvassing company and then quit that and started studying hair. Um, so hair for me felt like a solution because I was working with my hands and I had never been into a high-end salon before. I had always ever cut my own hair. Mm -hmm. So I, the first time I went into a salon was when I was there applying for a job. And, um, and that really shaped me because it felt valuable to have those kinds of relationships with clients. Um, it felt valuable to be working with material. I think of hair as a material. Um, and then also it was really, it gave me a lot of perspective because I was able to communicate with people and hang out with people who I would never meet otherwise, you know, because there are people coming into the, the salon. So then that was a really arduous process to go through this uh, apprentice program. It took four years. And I, that's during the time I was doing the artist way because I was really afraid I was losing myself because I had stepped away from my artistic practice. Um, and I had stepped away from working with sound. Mm -hmm. And so um, I did the, I, I just was like, feeling so bad, like, what am I doing? Who am I? And um, started making wigs, actually, right? Like really sculptural, fantastical wigs, which is the first time I ever started using this material, which I'm using right now. Okay. So the reason I even knew about the material is because in the salon for, for um, shows, we would use it to make hair pieces for the models, right? Like, we call it making a rat, it's called a rat, where you're making a piece that you can then use under the hair or put the hair over it. So that's when I started using this material. And then I started doing these 
independent projects, working with artists and being commissioned to make, I made a 54 foot wig for a dancer to wear um, at a production. And then I made this whole series of wigs for these vocalists to wear for, a, for another production. And um, I, so I became very interested in the sculptural and that and that's also when for me I started just dove in to hair as sculpture, hair as expression, how can these sculptural uh, like pretty abstract pieces be used to convey an inner environment of a character. Um, and then um, I left San Francisco and it was my and because of personal family stuff. Um, and I moved to New York. And before I moved to New York, I thought, okay, if I'm going to move to New York. Like, what do I actually want to do here? Because I knew for sure that no part of me wanted to work again in a high-end salon. I was like, no, I'm done with that life. That is not it for me. So why did you want to do that? Why? Uh, I wasn't interested in that experience. I, I didn't feel like it was valuable for me. I had done that. And, and like I mentioned in the beginning, like I, I had experienced a lot of things within that environment that just didn't feel good, didn't feel right. I wasn't able to be in my values. I wasn't able to be myself. Um, so leaving that, yeah, I was really like, well, how do I want to work this? And I went and, and I talked to a lot of people. I talked to people who were working on Broadway, doing wigs on Broadway. I talked to different salons to just kind of feel it out. And then, um, and I also talked to a woman who worked, had worked at this company that I was at in the Bay. And she had started a wig making company in, in Manhattan and she knew my work. She knew the work that I had been doing with wigs in San Francisco. So I started working with her. I moved to New York. Um, the, the crazy part about it is that my mom had gotten sick and, and passed really fast, like within a year. And I went to New York and I was like, okay, I'm gonna work with this woman who makes wigs for people going through cancer, who chemo. Right, so that was an incredibly potent time. Um, I learned a lot and, you know, it was like me arriving there, I was kind of apprenticing with her, but I also had the space to use as my own. Um, and that was formative because, well, I learned that I, I wasn't actually interested in making human hair wigs tying one hair at a time, because that's what it was, right? On um, lace, full lace wigs. But I did learn a lot about, um, it really influenced the way I thought about working with hair on humans. Um, uh, so when I, the biggest thing I learned working at that wig shop was that, was about growth pattern. Right. So in when you're making wigs for somebody and you're mimicking their specific hair when they have lost their hair, a lot of times in that environment, you're make those people who are going through chemo are people who have really super intense jobs and they're in an environment in Manhattan where any blood in the water, <laughs> they will get attacked. If people understand at that moment. At that point in time, the environment was, and it, maybe it's changed now, but at that point in time, the environment was like, if you're some person at this massive company or you're running a company and people know that you're sick, like that's not good. People were not wanting anyone to know that they were sick. So they would get a specialty wig made and that wig would be designed to mimic their hair specifically, particularly the the really important thing about that is that it's not mimicking the way the hair looks that makes it look real. It's actually mimicking the way the hair behaves, right? That's what makes it look like that person's hair. So that happens because of the way your hair grows. Um, that's your growth pattern. So this whole concept in wig making 
is what I have developed conscious haircutting with. It's like applied to like the, the power of the growth pattern is an identifying force in us as humans, which we know nothing about is what we're, I'm working with with clients here. Um, and I, I mean, I get really excited thinking about it and talking about it. And I kind of forgot for a number of years, like that part of my story, you know? And just recently I was like, yeah, it's because, I mean, I, I remember that it's because of the wig making that I'm really interested in growth pattern. But um, yeah, that's really informative. Like here is, you know, this is an absolute like joke. This is just the, this is like an example of what it looks like when you tie a wig, right? Except this is bundles of hair. This more looks like tying a rug. <laughs> but when you're tying a wig, you're using a lace that has six sides. It's hexagon weight lace. It's not four sides here, it's six, right? Depending on what, how you tie it and what side you tie it on is how the hair behaves. So for example, all of these are tied on this line of the square, right? And you can see that the hair is laying really flat. Let's say if we tied it, there's not really a good way to show you this, but but basically that is the hair's behavior. Like if I'm moving this around, it's, it's not changing. It's still laying flat. And so that's an example of how tying the hair, which on a wig, it would be one hair at a time uh, to one side of the lace influences the way the, the, the hair behaves on the lace. And that is what you use to make this incredible realistic sculpture of a full lace wig, right? And so the growth pattern, and this is just to, to illustrate that like growth patterns are like a thumbprint. It's completely unique. It develops when we're in the womb, you know, and it causes the behavior of our hair to, to be how it is. Uh, and that's really highly identifying. So conscious hair cutting is working with growth pattern. And that's, a, that's kind of a, a framework in and of itself. Because what I have noticed over the years of working with natural textures, and when I say natural textures, I know that means so much, so many different things to, to different people, right? Because there's like healthy hair versus natural hair. You know, it's like they, you know, they're not, they're not really saying, they're saying there's like Healthy hair means, oh, you can wear it and whatever. You can change your hair and texture. The point is that you're, you're taking care of your hair and it's healthy, right? Like you're not, you're not ruining your hair by altering its texture. And when, but specifically to me and what I'm talking about when I talk about natural textures is I'm speaking about, um, I'm actually talking about the root, the root, like the root of the hair and bringing, using growth pattern to let, to release more of your natural texture. So for example, I think it was Cynthia, who was the woman who was saying she has a lot of trauma attached to her hair. The percentage of people on this planet who do not have trauma attached to their hair is extremely small. <laughs> and, uh, but let's say with her texture, as I observed it, so in a cursory way over video for a few moments, with conscious haircutting, her waves could likely become curls, right? Because the approach to the hair is that, that it allows it to form the curls, right? It gives, it's another, it's another example of bringing spaciousness in. Um, so the other parts that are really fascinating, which I don't talk about too much because it's a little too esoteric for a lot of people, is just that, you know, hair is energy and our bodies are these, we are energetic beings and um, our heads are obviously so sensitive, so sensitive to touch, um, sensitive to, to any, any, any kind of touch, any kind of uh, stimulation. And when you're working with growth pattern, you start to notice that there's actually a different kind of energy. Energy gets released because you're balancing density. Like we have different densities 
of hair over our heads, over our whole heads, right? Like my hair that grows here does not grow the same number of hairs per square inch as it does at, at the nape of my neck, you know? And, and all humans have that, like the texture changes, the density changes over different parts of the head. Um, so working with that is what conscious haircutting is really about. And the things that make it conscious, because you say that and, and that word is thrown around quite a bit these days, but in my case, the reason I'm using that word is for three reasons. One is because of the approach, right? Like using the growth pattern. So approaching the human being in the chair in a conscious way. I'm not abstracting them by using techniques that were designed by one man and then spread out across the world. <laughs> I'm using techniques of observation and looking at the actual nature of the head and the hair and the way the hair grows and using that as a basis of design. So that's the first level of consciousness. <clears throat> the second level is that starting to have conversations within that process about the understanding of the self, right? Like allowing somebody to just see themselves talking about themselves in the mirror <clears throat> and how, empower how powerful that is because it's such an opportunity to be empowered, to do positive affirmations and mirror work, to appreciate yourself, to make the, the absolute most and joyousness out of your own self, body and beauty and total self-acceptance, you know? And then also, what is the opposite of that? The opposite of that, okay, not opposite, that's a little harsh, but like what we are conditioned to do is think that we have to fix our hair, especially around curls and texture. Everything is like anti-frizz, smoothing serums and all this stuff, right? So looking at a bottle of product that says like color safe, anti-frizz smoothing serum uh, by L'Oreal. And the bottle is like this thick plastic and it's wrapped in plastic and it's sold in a store and there's tons of marketing designed around that product. You know, that has an incredible story of significance about what's going on societally, you know? Here's what we value. We value hair that is colored, so we're not aging. We value hair that has perfect curls, not just curls. They have to be anti-frizz, they have to be smooth, you know, and, and also you have to buy it so that you can own it and you can put it on your body so that you can be better, you know? Um. Our marketing is very um, sad what it does to people. Yeah, I want to so, uh, end on a I want to end on a happy note. Yes, I, I sorry. think that <laughs> I think that not that it's not happy, but I mean you know it's like very deep. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And I think that I think that it's um, very informative and helpful because I think you know like we're talking about the mirror work. I it's so sad like. Um, I'm on this, I'm on these different intermittent fasting groups and um, it's so sad when people lose weight and they're just like, oh, I'm so beautiful. And other people say they're so beautiful. And you're like, you're beautiful before, <laughs> you know, yeah. like you can be, you're, you'll be beautiful. You lost the weight, you're beautiful with the weight. You're beautiful, you know, like beauty, it, you have to be beautiful no matter what you look like. And it's so sad to hear some of these comments. It's like, you know, like your beauty is defined by your weight. And it's like, that's not what makes you beautiful. You know, yeah. so just like the hair, you know, like whether your hair is straight or curly, it's like, or yeah. wavy or, you know, 4C or 3B or 1A or whatever. Yeah. Um, that we're all, we're all, we all have to accept ourselves and, and think of ourselves as beautiful. So I have these goddess cards and mm -hmm. I did them um, first, my first co-create, I think, yeah. And um, so I have three sets of cards. So I have, so like, can you get um, on the side of my computer? There's two other sets of cards. So I have goddess cards and then I have two sets of cards that I created. They're flower cards and then affirmation cards. And so we can do that. So 
we're going to metaphorically put your hands out here, Lauren. So just, I need your yeah. energy. <laughs> okay, I'm here. All right. And then I'm going to shuffle the cards. You can tell me when to stop. Okay. I would, I, I would like for you to stop when you feel it. Okay. Card just dropped out. So that's your card. <laughs> yes. Thank you. All right. So, um, Rianon, sorceress, you are a magical person who can manifest your clear intentions into reality. So I'm not familiar with um, the whole thing. Sorry, I'm going to read it. Uh, a large part of my power stems from my connection to animals and nature. If you've been outdoors too long, you can recapture your personal power by simply stepping outside. The simply, simple notion will do you a world of good and reawakening your sleeping, magical, spiritual nature. Allow the light of the sun, the moon, and the stars to stir ancient memories that may be dormant. Recall the times of your magical abilities and then put them to use immediately for the good of the entire planet. Resume the mission that was once aborted through the misdeeds of past time leaders. Take up your spiritual arms and move with swift speed into the night, awakening one and all to the magic that is life itself. This is a mission that must be accomplished and you're the one who can help us with it. Various meanings of this card. Have absolute faith that your dream is manifested. Make a clear decision, put your energy into manifesting your dreams. Know that you deserve to receive good. When you win, others win too. Keep your thoughts focused on your desire and away from fear. The lunar Welsh goddess name means great queen. As she serves important functions, including being the muse of inspiration for poets, artists, and royalty, she lovingly carries souls from earth to the afterlife plane upon her trusty white horse, helping them adjust to the transition of life after death. A shapeshifter, we are non, can appear as you to you as an animal, bird, or song. Call upon her help with manifestations, spirits, communication, transitions, or artistic inspiration. Mm. How perfect! I know, right? I I guess the third time I've received the message today to go outside and get in nature. Oh, really? Yeah. I was wondering what, like, I was wondering if you heard that. Yeah. What were you wondering? I was wondering if you heard that about going outside, being in nature, the animals and stuff like that. So, all right, I have affirmation cards. This is based, yes, on, this is based on, on our body. Like, I'm so all really excited to do all three cards, but also do you, if you want to pull a card for yourself, are you going to pull one for yourself? Okay, a goddess? I will. Because you know what? I did. I forgot to uh, join the full moon um, oh to um, pull a card for myself because I was, I think I was so tired and I did some rituals. So let me do that. See which goddess I'm going to be or called upon. God's just calling upon me. I'm giving you my energy too. <laughs> okay. Nia Matona, sacred space. Create an altar or visit a power place to connect with the divine. I think that's time for winter cleaning get rid of things. Oh, nice. I'll read a little bit about what. Yeah, please do. So I'm not really from just some of them I'm really familiar with and other ones that I'm not. Your sacred space is within you now. By creating your altar or visiting a sacred site, you connect with the symbols and energy that have been infused with meaning and prayer over the centuries. Don't take these symbols lightly. 
for their powerful indeed. When you connect with sacred symbols, you help your inner sanctity find a home in the outer world. You also tap into the ancient wisdom and spiritual grace of the old ways. Explore spirituality through sacred symbols and sites and allow your soul to joyfully meander among the various ways available to you to unite with the divine. It's not a matter of how you connect, but that you do so frequently. Build an altar in your home, take a spiritually oriented trip. You need a quiet place of refuge and retreat for yourself. Create a medicine circle or a labyrinth, walk the labyrinth, clear the energy in your home with sage, prayer, toning, invoking Archangel Michael, Archangel Michael or other space clearing methods. Name um, Sacred Guru because she protects the ancient Celtic ceremonial sites, which were outdoors in sacred groves and trees. Neem Antona continues to watch over sacred sites, especially those connected with nature. She'll help you build your own sacred space and will assist with medicine wheel or labyrinth ceremony. It's so funny because I was thinking about labyrinth. There's a labyrinth on my bed, like a, um, a program. Um, and I was thinking about like, I want to do a labyrinth in New Haven. There's one in Brantford, which uh -huh. is a town right next to New Haven. And I love labyrinths. I think that they're so meditative. And, yeah. Um, I do a lot of um, hand ones for people like um, finger labyrinths, you know? Um, so you can do them online. You can make, you can make them out of clay. I think I need to go to nature. And also I've been getting the um, hair fonts in um, Taro. And so like saying like, be, I need to be by myself. I need to, like I went up to Boston and for some business and it was like supposed to be like by myself. But I saw my friends and stuff like that. And it's like, no, you just need to be by yourself. I've been feeling like I just need to be by myself. Totally. Yeah. These it's are so awesome. valuable. These are affirmation cards. So this is part of an exhibit with our bodies, ourselves, the 60th anniversary of it. Was it 40th or I think 60th or maybe, oh, who knows? It was a, it was a monumental year <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> for, for the book. So there was a show in New Haven. It was really great. And I did this installation called So I made these cards and they were first time I've made cards because I wanted to use them as a, a way to facilitate conversation when people come down. You know, it's kind of weird when people come and sit down in your installation. You're like, hey, I'm the artist, you know, like, yeah, you know, let's talk, you know? So, but it's a it's a discussion starter. So tell me when to stop and then I'll pick a card for you. Okay. 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 And then I'm spreading them and then I'm doing magic hands and tell me when to pick a card for you. Okay, let's see. Okay, stop, stop moving for just a moment. Okay, I think it's your middle finger on your right hand. This one right yeah. here? Uh-huh. All right. I trust the wisdom of my body. I trust the wisdom of my body. Why do you think that you got that? Uh, let's see. I mean, the first thing that came up for me was related to my work. Um, and that I feel like saying that to people. <laughs> yeah. That's good. All right, yeah. I'll pick a card. Self-love comes to me with ease. I've been trying to work on radical self-love and putting myself first. It's so hard. Because I think that like the way that I was like trying not to feel guilty about that, especially like when you're like, and in Boston, like, you know, like I got a hotel room so I could just like do whatever I want and I want to go to sleep right now. 
And I felt, she felt so bad, but I was just like, you didn't ask me what I want, you know? Like, yeah, right yeah, now, yeah. I want to go to sleep. And you know that I go to sleep early and it's one o'clock in the morning. And I, that's, I, I can't do anymore. I go to bed at nine. Like I've done all that I can do. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. And I, I feel like that's the same thing. That's what, that's the, that's the same thing as trusting the wisdom of your body, right? It's like, yeah, no, you're, you know, I, I know my body knows what I need right now. Yeah. So these are flower cards. So part of that exhibit, you know, cause the, our body, our cells had to do a woman reproduction that, you know, I got into florology and like, you know, being able to speak through tongues and codes and stuff like that. So I, so these are flower cards. So there's different flowers. Yeah. Okay. So look, we we're talking about Oshun and Oshun's flower is sunflower. So I guess oh. that's my that's my card, adoration and dedication. Beautiful. So is is so, Oshun the goddess that asks for mirror work? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. And I so this is the this is the insulation behind me. Okay, so yeah. That's one one view of it. So tell me when to stop with the shuffling. Okay. I like the shuffle view cam. <laughs> okay. You tell me to stop. You, you can stop, stop now. Okay. You can stop now. <laughs> okay. All right. And then. I was waiting for one to fall out. Okay. And so you're not supposed to really look now at the flowers. So just tell me to stop and pick. I would say if just use your use your senses and and if you would love if you would choose a card for me. Okay. All right. You got lark, larkspur, levity and lightness. Levity and lightness. I do need that. All right. So you're in Mexico City, girl. I mean, I mean, it's during COVID, so I don't know like how. Yeah. You yeah. know, so but go get you some margaritas up on the on the um on your roof, you yeah. know. Put on yeah. some mariachi. Put on some mariachi music. I love. Yeah. I just love that. You no, know, get my... some can get some candles. Yeah. You know? Get some bubbles. Get you know. Um, I wish I was in a warm place right now. I kind of miss Jamaica. I, oh miss my God, I miss my family's house in Jamaica. Ah, yeah. yeah. What is? Does your family still have their house? Yeah, yeah, we have. A, yeah. Okay, okay, so, good. Yeah, and it's it's a family house. You can't go to any one person. It has to go to the whole family. Yeah, the that's whole family. wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Well, Thank We've you. Got so just a couple much. more minutes left. So, yeah. Uh, final words. <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool. So, um, yeah. Thank you so much. It's like, it's been, so, it's so interesting from week to week. And then, you know, I look at December and um, all like the varying different types of people that will be on the show. Like next week, it's going to um, be Jamie Sunwoo. And she works with, um, she's Korean American and she went to Yale. And um, as an undergraduate, and we um, also were in a fellowship together, um, laundromat project. But she works with spam and and does like installation work that's amazing. Um, but then also does performance and talks about her Korean American heritage and um, America and the relationship with Korea and all that kind of stuff. So she's on next week, and then. Um, we have um, Ali who does um, printing and Layla who is uh, right before the holidays, um, who is the editor of Wine Enthusiast. And um, um, we end with my friend, Patty Moreno that works in quilts and a whole bunch of other things. But all you guys do all these different amazing things. You're all Renaissance women. Cool. and. It was such a pleasure to have you on the show. It's so wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. And I was trying to think if there's any kind of like 
card thing I can do. And the only thing I could think of is using all the different essential oils, like a card. <laughs> And picking an oil for you, which is like an essence, which is like a card. So can we do that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Let me let me grab that. Okay, so I'm not going to shuffle, but these are, so I'm just going to move my hands around in here and you tell me when to stop. Okay, pick. Oh, okay. Rose. Oh, uh -huh. that's my favorite flower. <laughs> and that is my name. <laughs> <laughs> Synchronicity. There you no, go. It's all love. It's all love. You know, say, I see I picked out self-love. I got Rose. You know, yes. well, maybe, maybe it's a, it's a forecasting about romantic love, Lauren. Yeah. And it's, also, I think red roses do typically represent romantic yeah, love. It Pink does. and white yeah, it does. and different yeah. colors are different. Yeah, things. it is. Yeah. So I'm afraid now, you know, what does 2021 have to offer me? That's you know? right. Who knows? Something good. So I will see you tomorrow at 11. <laughs> Sounds good, Nadine. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Thanks. For, Thank you, Rose. Thank you for joining us, Lauren. Yeah. All right. Thanks for hosting and have a good night. Have a you nice too. evening. All right. Bye. 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 Thank you.